All right, well, thanks so much for having me. So I'm going to talk about monarch butterflies and how they may use herbal medicine. And some of this should, you know, sort of have similarities with a lot of the things that you have been talking about. And I understand that you're going to the botanical gardens this Sunday or on a Friday. And so there is actually milkweeds growing there. I think it's too early in the season to actually see monarchs, but you may be on the lookout for some of the milkweeds that we'll be talking about today. So during this talk, just interrupt me whenever, when something isn't clear, when you want to add something or you know anything along those lines. I want to make one announcement actually. Today at 4 o'clock in um, the Harlan Cinema there is a talk by Jerry Coyne. Jerry Coyne is a very famous evolutionary biologist in the US and he's going to talk about why evolution is true, not whether it's true, why it is true. And I mean there's a very distinct difference of course in that wording. And he will also be signing um, his book that is also called Why Evolution is True. It should be very interesting. So again, so yeah, just ask me questions whenever. I have, you know, a number of slides. We don't have to get through it. So if you have particular questions, we can just get stuck on those and, and talk about interesting things. So monarch butterflies are very famous, especially in North America, because they undertake this huge migration every year, every fall. They go into millions and millions from North America to Mexico to overwinter and really escape the freezing temperatures in North America. And this is sort of why most people are interested in monarch butterflies. When you go to Mexico, it's a really spectacular sight. So this is one of the trees in which they cluster together and actually huddle together to get more warmth and survive this winter. And you can literally see layers upon layers of monarchs sitting on these trees. And sometimes you can't really see the tree for the butterflies. It's really quite impressive. There's other monarchs actually in Western North America America, and these go to the western coast, the California coast. They don't go to the trees in Mexico. Instead, they go to a lot of eucalyptus trees along the coast of, of um, western California. And so one of the things actually that we're doing, and that, that Andrew over there, raise your hand, Andrew, um, is actually involved in seeing if these different populations are genetically different or not. And so far, it looks like they're basically one pamictic population. So the, the changes in where they go for migration may be more determined by environment than by genetics. And we're further looking into this. So monarchs are very popular. This is sort of our lap attire. When you work in my lap, you have to wear these wings. That's, of course, not. <laughs> that's, of course, a joke. This is actually a butterfly festival in St. Mark's, Florida, the Panhandle of Florida. It's one of the stopovers where monarchs go every year on their way south to Mexico. And monarchs are extremely popular amongst the public. And you know, citizen scientists have really helped figuring out how these monarchs migrate to Mexico. This is not why we're interested in the monarchs. This is why we are interested. This is a very, very interesting and cool parasite. So people often ask me, do you work on monarchs because you know, they're cool insects? I say, no, I work on them because they get sick. And that is much more interesting to me. Like every other organism in the world, monarchs get parasites. They do get sick. A lot of people don't realize that, but that is the case. And here is, here is the coolest parasite that they can have. They have other things too. This is a parasite called Ophriocystis electroscara. I think you can get extra credit for pronouncing this properly and you know, spelling it correctly three weeks from now. And this is a parasite that forms spores that sort of look like rugby balls that are a bit deflated. They're about 50 micrometers long, which means that in the lab we can pick them up individually and really manipulate and really work with them very easily. And when monarchs are infected, they can really carry millions and millions of these on their abdomens. So when you look at all these monarchs here, that is really cool, millions of monarchs, but that also means millions of millions of parasites. And then this is, the, this is a milkweed. So monarch butterflies are very specialized on particular species for their larval food. And monarchs in particular are specialized on milkweeds, mostly in the genus Asclepias. And those are some of the species you can actually find in the botanical gardens. And what is interesting about those is that they contain chemicals, as we will discuss, that actually have an effect on the parasite and that then can be used as, as medicine against those parasites. One of the things I'm going to mention is other organisms that use milkweeds and I'm going to talk in particular about aphids and the reason I'll talk about those is that they can really change the chemistry of the plants and thereby change the medicinal properties of these milkweeds and that gives us some indication you know what chemicals are involved in the medicinal properties of these plants. So let's start by the, with, with the life cycle. So you, you may remember from reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which, uh, which Andrew actually gave to me when my son was born. And, and, and Andrew is the real sort of bio nerd. So he said, you know, I gave it to you because it's wrong, right? And in the book, it says that the, that the butterfly forms a cocoon. And everyone knows that butterflies don't form a cocoon. Butterflies form a chrysalis. 
moths form a cocoon, you know, and, and Andrew knew that very well. <laughs> but he still gave that book to me, and I have it in Dutch and English because um, I bring up my children bilingually, so I'm really, really bored with that story in both languages by now. <laughs> but it's also incorrect in the sense that these butterflies eat lollipops and ice creams and all stuff, sausages, and they don't do that, right? <laughs> butterflies are very specialized, in this case, on milkweeds, and that is important. All right, so monarchs lay eggs from eggs hatched little caterpillars. One of the first things they do is eat up the eggshell. And that, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of protein, a lot of resources in that. And then they start eating the milkweed foliage on which that egg is laid. And then they really grow. And, and you know, in about 12 days, they multiply their weight by a factor of 3,000. I once calculated that it's the same as me turning into two blue whales in two weeks from now. You know, one blue whale wasn't enough. So here we have the biggest mammal on Earth, but I needed two to have the same increase in weight. And in the lab, this happens in about 12 days. Then we get the chrysalis, not the cocoon. That takes about nine days. And in this, the metamorphosis happens. And then from that, a beautiful butterfly appears, comes out of that chrysalis, starts drying its wings, and the life cycle is round. Now, when we look at the parasite, so what we can say is we start with this monarch here. Say this is a female really infected with millions of these parasites. So here are the parasite spores. And they just sit there on the abdomen. They don't do anything. They're dormant. They are just sitting there as spores. They don't grow. They don't replicate. They just sit there and wait. And what do they wait for? Well, when the monarch lays an egg on the milkweed, what she does is transfer some of these parasites. And this is a very passive process. They just get stuck to the egg, stuck to the milkweed on which she lays an egg. And then we realize that this monarch starts eating that eggshell, starts eating the milkweed, so it starts ingesting the parasites. And what that happens is the parasites go into the midgut, they break open, little sporozoites come out, and they start replicating massively, mostly during the pupal stage. Then they undergo sexual replication. And at the point where the monarch comes out as an adult again, she can be covered in millions of these parasites. We can infect caterpillars with a single spore in the lab, and then the resulting butterfly will carry millions of these. So very rapid replication. And this is what we do in the lab. This makes us a very nice system. We can do the whole life cycle in the lab. So we can put little parasites on a bit of milkweed, give that to a caterpillar. The caterpillar will eat it up. We rear the caterpillars in, in plastic tubes in a climate chamber. The monarchs appear as adults. We can mate them. And so we can keep this going for several generations in the lab and do a lot of experiments to understand this interaction between the host and the parasite. And what we find really interesting is that, you know, when you look at host-parasite interactions in, in the field of ecology and evolution, this is usually what people do. We have a parasite and we have, we have the host, and that's about it, right? But what makes it so interesting to us in this system, as I have said, monarchs use food plants in the genus Asclepias. These are milkweeds, and they're very strongly affecting the interaction between the host and the parasite. And that makes it really interesting to us. And then we can also see how these monarchs then can change the use of these milkweeds to affect that interaction with their own parasites. And the other interesting thing is that there is these other community members, like I said, the aphids, and I'll talk about that, that can affect these plants and thereby indirectly affect the interaction between hosts and parasites. So we're really trying to understand these hosts and parasites in this community, ecological com community aspect. I'm going to talk about three things if we get through it. Um, the first is how do larval food plants really affect parasite growth and butterfly disease? And that's really the starting point to see if there is any herbal medicine occurring in this system. Then what role do milkweed secondary chemicals play? And you've learned a lot about all sorts of secondary chemicals that plants contain. Of course, plants have a lot of nutritional value, but then they also contain tons of chemicals that are not directly involved in nutrition, but can actually be really toxic to a lot of plants. And milkweeds are very toxic to most herbivores, but monarchs have um, specialized on them. So we're going to look at those chemicals. And then the final part is putting all that all together and saying when we find that some of these milkweeds are really medicinal, can we actually find that monarchs can, can use this information and use those plants as a type of medicine to cure themselves or their offspring of this parasitic disease? So the first question is, you know, what, what is the effect of different food plants, different milkweeds on the host and the parasite? Let me start by just giving you a little bit of background on, on you know, what would be in the interest of, of butterflies to, to get rid of this parasite and really reduce the symptoms and the disease. And so what we need to understand, first of all, is, is what happens in this life cycle that I've talked about very briefly. And the first thing that we find, and this, this is what you find in a lot of cases, if you have more spores, 
So this is a logarithmic scale, this is the number of parasites that we put in an egg and then feed that egg to a caterpillar. What we can see is that the more there are, that the higher the infection probability is. So when you're you know, bombarded with more parasite spores, you're more likely to be infected. This is the same in a lot of human diseases, right? If you have 10 people with flu sneezing at you, you're more likely to get diseased than if you just have one person sneezing at you. We see the same, so th this was parasites on eggs, we see the same if we put parasites on a leaf and feed that to caterpillars. Again, we see higher infection rates with higher numbers of parasites. And the other important thing is that when those numbers of spores that are ingested by the caterpillar are higher to start with, we also end up with higher parasite loads, so higher numbers of parasites on the adult butterfly when it emerges. And so it is that, that is important because what it suggests is that really the, the higher number of parasite spores that are on the eggs, that are on the leaves, will really increase the infection risk and also the number of spores on the adult butterfly. And so by really reducing this, the, the, par the monarchs may actually benefit. And the reason for that is that we also find really strong effects of the number of parasites on the disease symptoms. And so the first thing that, that we looked at, this is actually a very ugly picture of a monarch. This is not what you would see in National Geographic. Right? This is a sick, very, very sick, dying butterfly. We don't like that. Right? And so this butterfly is stuck, and we call this basically, you know, we have experiments that we used to call stuck experiments to see how many monarchs get stuck. And so this is happening when there's really a lot of parasites that sit on the abdomen, really disrupt the integuments, and the butterfly just oozes liquids and just gets stuck to the pupil case. It will never fly, it will never mate, it will never have any fitness. And what we can see is that the emergence probability so the probability that this doesn't happen, the probability that monarchs get out of the chrysalis fine, really goes down with increasing parasite loads on the, on the body. Right? So the more parasites you have, the less likely you are to actually get out of that pupil case and start flying and mating and do all your business. We also find that higher parasite loads are bad for mating. So the monarchs that do come out here, they get through this stage, we can see that the higher numbers of spores actually make them less able to mate and we don't know if that's because they're more you know less attractive or whether they are just not don't have the energy to mate that is something we still don't know but we do know that it reduces mating probability and the final thing is that when monarchs get past that stage you know what we find is that they generally live shorter when they have higher parasite loads so what we can tell from this this is all important from the monarch right because if, if you think about it if you sort of think about it from the human point of view of monarchs were humans, what would they want? They would want to reduce the number of spores that they're infected with because that really reduces the disease symptoms. And that is important as we will see. All right. So we have two species of milkweed here and this is actually one of those things in science, you know, you always, when you read textbooks of science and you take classes of science, everything seems like, you know, perfect and these people had great ideas and they did this for a reason. And what the textbooks don't tell you is that a lot of things that we find is based, based on chance and frustration. And so when I started working on monarchs, I got really frustrated with having to grow milkweeds. Milk, the monarchs are very picky. The only thing they eat is milkweeds. They don't eat artificial diet. And so I spent most of my time growing milkweeds in the greenhouse and I got really frustrated with it. So I said, let's just for fun grow a few different species and see if there is any effects. And it turns out there is and that is now you know, the basis of our whole research program. So chance and frustration is important in science. Just remember that if you get frustrated with your research project, that's a good thing. It may lead to new things. So we have two species here that I'm going to talk about a lot. Asclepias incarnata, which is swamp milkweed, pink flowers. Um, this is what the leaves look like. And Asclepias corosavica, tropical milkweed, which, you know, looks very similar. And oftentimes in our lab, people have real trouble. Sometimes they mess up their first experiments by feeding the wrong species to their monarchs because they look the same. And I always tell them, close your eyes and smell. You can't do that here. But these plants smell much more strongly than those. So there are some, some distinct differences. And what we did is take these plants and feed them to monarchs, infect those monarchs with parasites or leave them uninfected, and then see how, how long do these monarchs live. And the first thing I'm going to show is how long they live when they don't have parasites. So you rear them on the two species, um, Corosavica, the tropical milkweed in yellow, Incarnata, the swamp milkweed in orange. You can see they live about 20 days. So when there is no infection, these plants don't have a, a very big differential effect on these monarchs and the health of these monarchs. Then the next thing we did is we took four different parasites that we had um, cloned in the lab, 
infected monarchs with them then reared these monarchs onto those different species of milkweed and again measured their longevity. And what we can see now is very strong differences. So for all these four parasite genotypes, we can see that monarchs lived a lot longer when they were reared on Curisophica, the tropical milkweed, than when they were reared on Incarnata, the swamp milkweed. Right? The other thing, of course, we can see that overall they lived a lot shorter than when they were uninfected and that supports what we had found previously. But this is really important, right? So as an infected monarch, you're better off being reared or eating Curisophica than Incarnata milkweed. And the reason for that is that when you look at the relationship between the longevity of these monarchs and the parasite replication, so the number of parasites that these, that these parasites produce on the adult butterfly, you can see this um, <coughs> negative relationship. So here are the four, these are four averages for the four parasite genotypes that we looked at on, Incarna on Curisophica, the tropical milkweed, and we can see that this results in low spore loads and consequently high longevity of the adult monarchs. And then the incarnata points are, are right there. And so what we have is this really strong negative relationship. And it means that on incarnata, the parasite does a lot better, grows to much higher numbers, and therefore reduces the longevity of the monarchs to a much greater extent than the parasites that are reared on Curisophica, where you have low spore loads and high longevity of the monarchs. Right? So this was our first indication that the milkweeds are really important in affecting how well the parasite does and consequently how sick the monarch gets. Any questions on this? Does this all make sense? Just shout out if something isn't clear. All right. So what we did, this is all, always the royal we, so this is an experiment with Eleanor, who's a graduate student in the lab, and then three undergraduate students, Carlos, James, and Huey. We said, well, let's look at this and see how, you know, how common this, this pattern is. So let's take 12 species. We actually started with more, but some don't grow well in the greenhouse. So we're left with the ones that do grow well in the greenhouse. And rear monarchs and all these species and see how that affects parasite growth and the disease in the monarchs. And what we can see is really this, this continuous variation. So every point here is the mean for a plant species. And what we can see that when, when these plant species result in higher parasite growth, they result in shorter monarch longevity. And the other thing that was really interesting is these are actually the two species that we started off with. So Curisophica, the tropical milkweed up here, and Incarnata, the swamp milkweed down there. Right? So when we first did those studies, we were very lucky to pick plants that were really on the extremes of the spectrum. If we had just picked these two, we may have said, oh, there's nothing interesting happening. Right? So another effect of chance in science. So let's move on to understanding you know, what, what is causing these difference differences in the milkweeds. Is it nutrition? Are the monarchs just healthier on some species than others and thereby more able to resist the parasites? Or are there chemicals directly in the milkweeds that may have a negative effect on the growth and the infection success of the parasite instead? Now what's really important um, is that we have a lot of information that chemicals play a big role in monarch butterflies. And when you look at the coloration of monarchs, they have these very clear black and white and orange colors that are used a lot in nature to fend off predators. So when you see an animal that's very brightly colored, it either means it is being you know, attractive to the females in that species and the females are really selected for those colors, or it means, you know, get away, I'm toxic, don't eat me because it's a bad idea for you. And the reason that monarchs are toxic, they're really displaying this toxicity, is that these milkweeds contain chemicals that the monarchs build up in their tissues and it makes them toxic to their predators. So we have a really interesting case where presumably these chemicals evolved as a defense against herbivores. And indeed, if we were to eat milkweeds, we would probably die. So I always tell my students in the greenhouse, don't eat these milkweeds. If you get hungry, just go to the vendor machine because <laughs> it's not a good idea. But there is a couple of, um, there's about 10 herbivores insect species that can eat milkweeds because they have evolved resistance against these chemicals and what is more they take advantage of these chemicals and protect themselves. This was very nicely demonstrated in the 60s by Lincoln Brower. He's really the, the monarch guru, the biggest scientist working on monarchs and he did experiments where he reared monarchs on different species of milkweed that have different levels of these toxic chemicals, fed them to blue jays and then measured how long it would take for these blue jays to throw up. And so this is what they call in scientific terms the emetic response. I just call it speed to vomiting. And what you find is that when monarchs are reared on more toxic plants, the birds will vomit more quickly and really create this aversion to these monarchs. They won't 
they won't eat anything for one and a half hours after that, and they will never touch a monarch again. They've learned their lessons, you know, and say, oh, these bright colors are bad. I don't want to eat that horrible stuff anymore. Well, why is that? So we have cardiac glycosides that we also um, refer to as cardenolides, and these are these compounds that come in a lot of different forms. And I've shown two examples here, digitoxin and oabane, and these are very well characterized cardenolides that you can actually get from commercial suppliers. They don't necessarily occur in milkweeds, but this class of chemicals does. And what is important about these chemicals, I think, have you, you have talked about these, right? And how they can be used in heart medicine and actually in the right dose, not kill you, but help you, because it changes the rhythms in your heart. And they act on these sodium potassium channels that most eukaryotes have. And it's actually the genome of monarchs has been sequenced and it's actually been found that those sodium potassium channels have different mutations than all other eukaryotes. And that may explain why monarchs can resist, don't have you know, the negative effects or toxic effects of these chemicals. What is important is that these, these chemicals come in lots of different flavors and they really vary in their polarity. So oabane is a very highly polar molecule, whereas digitoxin is very nonpolar. And this is important because we think that if these chemicals really have an effect, say on the parasite inside the cells of the, of the monarch butterflies, then those chemicals that are nonpolar are more able to get through the cell membranes. And so they may be more important in acting as anti-parasite chemicals. And it seems that that is indeed the case. So the first thing we did with this information, and this was done with Mark Hunter, he is our collaborator at the University of Michigan, he's a chemical ecologist and has specialized on, on um, the cardenolites. The first thing we did was simply measure how many cardenolites do we find in Curasafica and how many do we find in Incarnata. Remember that Curasafica was the tropical milkweed that really reduced parasite growth and increased monarch health. And we see much higher concentrations than in the monarchs, rear, on, in the plants, of incarnata, which is the swamp milkweed that didn't reduce parasite growth. And the other thing, when you look at the whole diversity of these chemicals, when we look at incarnata, this is a histogram, so what this tells us is that 100% of the incarnata plants at this particular chemical, and we categorize this basically on the degree of polarity, just the speed by which they run off the HPLC machine. And 20% at, at a second cardenolite, so not very much diversity. If you look at Curasavica plants, you can see a huge amount of diversity. So not only do Curasavica plants have a higher overall concentration, they also have a lot of more different chemicals in them. And what is important, they have a lot of very nonpolar chemicals that we think may, important, may be important biologically. And we have followed this up. I showed you that experiment with the 12 species of milkweed, so we have analyzed those for the cardenolites too. And what we can see here, this is basically the total cardenolite concentration for uninfected monarchs. And every point here is the mean for a milkweed species, and here are infected monarchs. But we can see for uninfected monarchs, there's actually a suggestion that high numbers of cardenolites are costly. So even though monarchs are resistant to these chemicals, they're not completely resistant. And when you increase the chemicals, you actually reduce the longevity of monarchs. But then for the infected ones, there is this, this interesting actually relationship where, where one of the milkweeds has such high cardenolite concentrations that even in infected monarchs, they suffered from it. But generally speaking, in this part of the curve here, we can see that when you increase cardenolite concentrations of these species of milkweed, the monarchs are actually better off when they're infected with the parasite. And so what that suggests is that although these, these chemicals are somewhat bad for the monarch, they're worse for the parasite. Right, and that is true for a lot of drugs. I mean, a lot of drugs are bad for us, but they're worse for our parasites, and when we're sick, we take them, because we're in balance, we benefit from them. So we did some multivariate analyses. I'm not going into the details, but we can basically look at this whole diversity of all these chemicals, and we can create summary measurements of them and to see how these different species differ. And what we can see is that what we call this two-dimensional space where we have these different measures, we can see that on general all these different milkweeds are scattered in different places, showing they have different communities, different diversities, different concentrations of these chemicals. And when you look at two particular um, measures of these chemicals, what we can see, and this is what we call NMDS axis 1 and axis 2, and all these details aren't important. What is important is that these measurements give us different views on the chemicals. So, for example, when you look at NMDS axis 1, it tells us some particular um, 
characters of these chemicals and access to gives us information on other characters of these chemicals. And what we see for this first axis, we can actually see that for uninfected and infected monarchs, the higher this, this measure is, the worse of the monarchs are. So these are probably chemicals that are really bad for monarchs, whether they're infected or not. But then this, this second measure of chemicals, there is this, this slight decrease for uninfected monarchs, but an increase for infected monarchs. So monarchs that are infected actually live longer on milkweeds that have a higher value in this axis. So what this tells us is that there's particular chemicals that are bad for all the monarchs and particular chemicals that are bad for uninfected monarchs but on balance are beneficial for infected monarchs. And so this gives us one way to actually start looking at which chemicals are really important. Can we try to purify them and actually then use those to treat our monarchs. Now another way we got at this Actually, our first really strong indication that cardenolites are important was an experiment where we included aphids and see how they affect the chemicals of plants and then indirectly how that affects the virulence and the growth of the parasites. So here's Andrew again. So you see that most of our research depends on Andrew. And here he was still a high school student and now he is a master's student in the lab. So maybe next he'll be a, a graduate student and then after that he'll take over my lab, he'll give this lecture in four years from now. <laughs> Right? But so he, he basically came in for a summer, it was only about six weeks, right? And so again, that was, that was an experiment born out of frustration. I remember Andrew coming in and saying, yeah, I'm so sick of these aphids. Why don't we do something interesting with them? See if these aphids have an effect. Because these aphids find our greenhouse every year, take over our greenhouse, and we have to get rid of all our plants and start over again. I said, well, you know, let's take advantage of these really annoying animals and see if they affect the chemicals and thereby affect the, the disease of the monarchs. So Andrew became really good at counting in this project. That was the main thing he learned. So he could go back to, to high school, say, I learned how to count. That was very <laughs> useful. Because what we did on the, on the first day of this experiment, we, we added six aphids to these plants. And then every few days, Andrew would go in and count all the aphids on the plants. And I'm still not sure how accurate these counts are, but overall, they, they show a very similar pattern. So over 13 days, you can see really rapid increases mostly on the, the swamp milkweed, the incarnata, less so on Corisavica, but basically exponential growth of aphids over time. And actually, why, why do they grow less on Corisavica? This may be because of the higher levels of, of these cardenolites. We don't know. But what we did then is at 13 days, when we had really tons of these aphids on the plants, we said this poor caterpillar is now going to be added and infected with, cat with, with parasites. See how, how have these aphids affected the plants and thereby the, the parasite of the monarchs. So what I'm going to show you first is the difference between incarnata and Corisavica plants for plants that don't have aphids. So this is exactly what we, what we saw before. So as we saw before, when you rear monarchs on the tropical milkweed Corisavica, they have lower spore loads, they suffer lower numbers of parasites than when they're reared on the swamp milkweed incarnata. And consequently, as we saw before, they therefore live longer on Corisavica, the tropical milkweed, than on Incarnata, the swamp milkweed, right? So this is not surprising. This is the controls we did to make sure that things still work the same as they had before. But then we add the aphids and something interesting happens. So now we see no longer a difference between the two different species of milkweed. Right? These light colored bars are now at the same level. So in other words, by adding aphids, we took away this, this reduction in spore loads on this medicinal milkweed. In other words, these, these aphids just took away the medicinal properties of this milkweed. Very bad news for the monarchs, right? No longer a difference. And as a result, then the, the monarchs lived shorter than they would have done without aphids. So on Corisavica, the tropical milkweeds, you know, the aphids now reduce the longevity of the monarchs where previously they actually benefited from this plant um, with respect to the other plant, there is now long, no longer a difference. So adding aphids sort of makes Corisavica, the tropical milkweed, into incarnata plants in terms of the antiparasitic effects. So why is this occurring? So again, we looked at the chemicals, and this is very similar to a picture I showed before. Again, in yellow, we have Corisavica, the tropical milkweed, seeing a lot of diversity in all these different chemicals. And we looked at these in very great detail and actually found really interesting things happening for two of these chemicals. And I'm going to refer to them as RT584 and RT650. Again, this is based on the, the amount of time they take to run off the HPLC. But it's important they're at this spectrum of the range, right? So they're the very nonpolar cardenolites that we think should be biologically active. 
what we can see is for this first one, if we look at the chemicals on day zero, our plants with and without aphids have similar concentrations, right? And this makes sense because we chose these plants randomly then added aphids on half of them. And then over the 13 days, what we can see when there is no aphids, the concentration of this chemical really goes up. So when the plant grows and matures, the chemicals really go up during these 13 days. But what we can see is that when the aphids are present, this induction, this growth, you know, this increase of the chemicals is really stopped by the aphids. And so on day 13, there is very few of these chemicals, actually the same as there were on day, day zero. So we now have a big difference on day 13 where aphid infested plants have lower chemical concentrations than the plants without aphids. And we see a similar pattern for the second chemical. Again on day zero, no difference. We see very strong increase in the concentration in plants without aphids, but a much weaker increase on the plants with aphids. So again, the aphids somehow decrease the increase of the chemical, right? Gets confusing, but that is basically what happens. The main point is that on that day, on day 13, when we did the infection experiments, there was big differences in the chemicals between the plants with and without aphids. And for these two chemicals, that's important because we found correlations. When you have more of this, this cardenolite, so RT584, the spore load, so the reproduction of the parasite is reduced. In other words, when aphids prevent the increase of this chemical, there will be more parasites and the monarchs will get sicker. And we see the same happening for the second chemical. Again, when you have higher concentrations, longevity or the spore load of the parasite goes down. So again, the aphids reduce the concentrations, thereby increase the parasite growth and thereby increase the disease of the monarchs. Any questions on this? Yes? Um, how, do you know how the aphids um, change the chemical composition of the plants? We don't really know, and we also don't really know why they do it. So the, there is one hypothesis that says, you know, the chemicals are somewhat bad for the aphids, so they can manipulate the chemicals, so it is actually in their interest. There is another hypothesis that says the plant is actually a plant defense, so there is all these aphids, and instead of giving my chemicals to the aphids, which will, will then protect the aphids against predators, I'm going to reduce the chemicals so that the aphids are more vulnerable to, to predators. And neither of those have been really tested or, or supported. But the mechanism we don't know. We know that, mil that milkweeds and a lot of plants are very sensitive to, to damage. So we can, when we damage the plants, even just with scissors, they can change the chemical concentrations. Yeah. All right. So the final part is then saying, you know, we have seen these very strong effects of different milkweeds. Some milkweeds are very medicinal, other milkweeds are not. And so the question is, can monarchs use this? And I remember when we first found these results, our first thought was, well, this would be really cool. It'd be a really cool idea. And we wrote the first paper on the difference between Corosavica and Incarnata plants. We said in the discussion, you know, it would be really interesting to see if monarchs can do this. And one of the reviewers, so in science you have this peer review process and the reviewer said, well, that's complete nonsense and you have to remove that. So we removed that from the, from the paper. And of course, there's no better way to encourage someone to do experiments to, than to tell them that they have stupid ideas. Okay. So that's what we did. Our aim was to disprove that reviewer. So there's a lot of ways that monarchs could use these medicinal milkweeds. And when we look, this is the same life cycle that I looked at before. And there's a lot of animal behaviors out there in nature that could apply to monarchs and that could really help them fight their parasites. And the first one is simply say, well, can these monarchs avoid you know, the parasites and not eat the eggshells because there's parasites on them? The second one is, can monarchs then walk away from the milkweed on which there are parasites? So these are two you know, avoidance behaviors that don't really have anything to do with medication in terms of the milkweeds, but with preventing infection in the first place. I'll talk about those very briefly. And then there's potentially three medication behaviors. The first one is that when, when given a choice, monarchs should preferentially eat as caterpillars those medicinal milkweeds and not eat the non-medicinal milkweeds. Or if they have not been given a choice, then what they may do is simply eat more of the medicinal milkweed. So if they have only access to medicinal milkweed, they may just eat more. That's just similar to us eating more medicine because we think it will help. You know, and in some cases, higher doses may help. But then the final one is, is 
is actually the mothers medicating their offspring. And we know that monarchs are very good at locating milkweeds. They're very picky in which milkweeds they use. And so the question is, are they able to pick out the medicinal milkweeds and lay their eggs preferentially on medicinal milkweeds that will make their offspring less infected and less sick? So we looked at all these. And so let's start with the boring results. And these are the, the avoidance results. So the question is, do monarchs avoid eating the eggshell when it has the parasite on it? So it's very simple experiments. We had eggs with and eggs without eggs or, or parasites. And it simply said, how many of the monarchs that come from these eggs then eat up that eggshell? We can see that in infected monarchs, 80% of those caterpillars eat up the eggshell. So 80% of them eat the eggshell when there are parasites. And of uninfected monarchs, about 80% eat the eggshell when there was no parasites, right? So there is no difference. We would have expected, you know, this gray bar to be much lower if the monarchs could avoid the parasite and could avoid being, you know, eating the eggshell when it has parasites on it. So no evidence for avoidance there. Also no evidence that monarchs preferentially eat milkweed that has no parasites on it. So we gave them two leaf discs, one with parasites, one without, and say, you know, which leaf disc do the monarchs eat? And so what we see is this is the 50-50 line. And so that is really the proportion of monarchs that chose to eat the contaminated, the parasite contaminated egg. And there's actually two doses that we used to see, you know, maybe if there are more parasites, they have stronger preferences. But, you know, there is no differences from 50-50. So these monarchs just choose at random which leaf disc they're going to eat. So they have no way to detect the parasites or if they could detect them to do something about it. They're just stupidly eating these milkweeds, you know, even when they're covered in parasites. Here they're stupidly eating their eggshells, right? So they have not evolved a way to, to deal with that. So then we said, okay, how about if you don't have a choice and you just feed monarchs on the tropical milkweed, which is medicinal, versus the swamp milkweed, which is not, you know, do the monarchs that are infected simply eat more of the medicinal milkweed and thereby increase the chemical concentrations in their bodies and fight the parasite? So this is shown for the diet on Kurosafika, the tropical milkweed, that's the medicinal milkweed. And this is how much infected monarchs eat in the gray bar, in the white bar, is how much uninfected monarchs eat. There is no difference. So infected monarchs don't eat more of the medicinal milkweed than do uninfected monarchs. This is the control to see if you know, there's any differences in consumption of the non-medicinal milkweed. And again, infected monarchs eat as much as uninfected monarchs. So they don't alter their intake of the medicinal milkweeds. So that's all boring. So let's look at something more interesting. So then we said, okay, so instead of eating more of the milkweed, monarchs may just simply choose the milkweeds that are good for them, right? And so the first way they can do that is if you're a caterpillar and you're given a choice between the medicinal curasafica and the non-medicinal incarnata, do the monarchs go to the medicinal milkweed and eat more of that than of the non-medicinal milkweed? This sort of thing has actually been shown in other, in other caterpillars that have a very wide diet and they can actually choose the, the, um, the plants that have higher alkaloids that are bad for their parasites. And then the second hypothesis was saying, okay, no, it is, it is the caterpillars just don't do anything, but it's really the mothers that do. And we said this is probably the most likely way in which medication can evolve in the system. So monarchs, when they're, they're females and they lay eggs, they are the ones that are really good at finding milkweeds. We know they're very picky. When you see a monarch come to a milkweed patch, they often reject a lot of the plants before they lay an egg. So they must really be able to tell differences in quality between plants. And we said, so this may actually happen. So maybe these monarchs, when they're adults, they decide where their offspring are going to be and they're going to choose the milkweeds that are good for their offspring. So experiments were done, this was done by, by Thierry, postdoc in my lab, and Lindsay was a Shore student who worked here for a summer. And so for the choice test for caterpillars, what we basically did was provide piles of leaves, you know, and carefully measured that they were the same amount of incarnata and curasafica, and then basically over the lifetime of the caterpillar measured how much they ate of each species. And this is showing the proportion of the total diet that consisted of the medicinal milkweed, in black for infected monarchs, in white for uninfected monarchs. And that's boring again, right? There's nothing interesting happening. So it's 50-50 in both cases. Infected monarchs ate 50% of their diet comes from the medicinal milkweed, 50% from the non-medicinal milkweed. For the uninfected monarchs, exactly the same story. 
it's 50-50. So 50% is medicinal, 50% is non-medicinal. So then we moved on to adults, and what we did is we have a greenhouse um, on the parking deck behind the biology department, and we set up five big flight cages, and each cage we put two different plants, so the medicinal plant and a non-medicinal plant. And then we added a monarch, whether it was uninfected or infected, gave it an hour, and see how many eggs do they lay over that time. And simply say, do they lay more eggs on the medicinal milkweed when they are infected? And now we had something much more interesting. So here we have infected monarchs, and this is the proportion of the eggs that they laid on the medicinal milkweed. So what we can see is infected monarchs lay a much higher proportion of their eggs on the medicinal milkweed than on the non-medicinal milkweed. And on average, about 68% of their eggs were laid on the medicinal milkweed. In contrast, the uninfected monarchs showed tons of variation, but overall it's more like 50-50. They lay 50% on one plant, 50% on the other. There's really not a lot of differences there. Right? And so what this tells us, this is very interesting to us, because we have seen that the caterpillars didn't do anything. Right? They didn't really prevent, you know, eat medicinal milkweed and reduce their own disease. What we know from the way the life cycle works is that infected mothers cannot do anything about their own infection. They're already infected. They have these millions of spores sitting on their body. They also cannot prevent transmitting them to their offspring because this is a passive process when they lay an egg, so it is really unavoidable. But what they apparently can do is when they do lay an egg and transmit those parasites, is lay them on plants that will give their offspring the best chance for survival. Right? So it will reduce the infection probability of their offspring, it will reduce the parasite growth, and thereby really increase the health of their offspring. So what we have talked about, we've seen that milkweeds vary in their medicinal properties, then I explained some results that suggest that cardenolides, these secondary chemicals, really appear to account for some of these medicinal effects. And finally, that monarchs, and in particular adult monarchs, can really change their, their interaction with their parasite by preferentially using the medicinal milkweeds. And so really this suggests to us that these milkweeds are using herbal medicine in, in the fight against their own parasites. Let me just finish by thanking a lot of people that have worked with us on all these experiments and getting all these data ready. And thank you for listening to this talk.